a ketogenic diet can elevate the ketone body beta hydroxybutyrate and that has signaling functions that's associated with longevity pathways. Ketones are the brain's super fuel. They need a lot of them. How do ketones really stack up against carbs? Food we eat and the mental health association. With more people saying diet affects their mood, it affects their focus, resilience to stress. Would ketosis diet work or does it rely on fat, beta hydroxybutyrate, BHB part, from non-protein sources, does it affect? When you fast, it tends to rapidly put you into a state of ketosis within about 24 to 48 hours. I think we can universally agree that better glycemic control will correlate to improved cardiometabolic biomarkers in the long run. Hello and welcome to Khan Clinic, our weekly health show powered by American Muslim Today. In each episode, we dwell into the realms of wellness, exploring the latest trends, expert advice, and practical tips to help lead you a happy, healthier life. We aim to bring a broader perspective to our American audience on issues that impact your daily life by interviewing guests from the U.S., and around the world. From nutrition and fitness to mental well-being and beyond, we're here to empower you with knowledge and inspiration. So whether you're looking to boost your energy, revamp your diet, or simply trying to find a balance in your lifestyle, you're at the right place. Join us as we embark on a journey towards a better, brighter you. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan, and together let's unlock the secrets to living life to its fullest. From cutting edge metabolic therapy to breakthrough insight on ketosis and longevity, today's episode dives into the science of optimizing our bodies and minds in a way we never thought it would be possible. Welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Our guest today, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, is the forefront of research into ketogenic diet, metabolic health, and performance optimization. Areas that could redefine how we approach nutrition, resilience, and overall well-being. He's an associate professor at the University of South Florida and a research scientist with the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Dr. Augustino has worked with the NASA, the Department of Defense, and other institutions. Give him a unique perspective on how to harness our metabolic systems for extreme resilience and health. Dr. D'Agostino, welcome to the show. Hi, Amir. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Honor to have you, sir. Let's start off by asking what's on everyone's lips. It's even being called a metabolic game changer. But beyond that buzz, what does ketosis actually do in the body? And what's fueling this renewed excitement around ketosis, ketones in the modern diet? Please. Yeah, that's a great question. Nutritional ketosis, we like to define it as therapeutic ketosis, is a specialized diet that involves a unique macronutrient uh, ratio. The macronutrients being the ratio of fats to proteins to carbohydrates. And when that ratio uh, is ketogenic, as it meets the clinical ketogenic ratios, that transitions your metabolic physiology to burning glucose as its primary energy source with a normal diet to burning primarily fat and ketone bodies as an energy mm -hmm. source. And this metabolic transition changes our brain neuropharmacology uh, in ways that has anti-seizure effects and neuroprotective effects. Excellent. Everyone's looking for a secret to long, live longer and healthier. From what you've seen in your research, resilience and extreme environment, how does that play a role in longevity and ketosis diet? Yeah, I think uh, there's 
definitely an emerging interest in the longevity field and longevity medicine, basic science research and clinical research, because a ketogenic diet alters many of the signaling pathways and cardiometabolic biomarkers that are pathophysiologically linked. They're mm -hmm. linked clinically with premature aging. So that would be, or the early onset of chronic diseases, including cardiovascular, neurodegenerative diseases, and also cancer. So a ketogenic diet can elevate the ketone body beta hydroxybutyrate, and that has signaling functions that's associated with longevity pathways. Excellent. And this uh, beta hydroxygenase has an important role in the findings. You mentioned a little bit about the ratio earlier. Would you like to elaborate a little bit more on that, sir? Sure. Yeah. Uh, a ketogenic diet is a unique diet because it's the only diet that we have that's defined by the elevation and sustainment of a biomarker. So unlike a vegan diet or a Mediterranean diet, a ketogenic diet is specifically defined by an elevation of blood, urine, or breath ketone levels. And the blood beta hydroxybutyrate is the primary ketone body in circulation. And that can function as an alternative energy substrate for the brain and the heart. And uh, it also, it has its own receptor and transporter mechanism, and it suppresses inflammatory pathways, including an inflammasome that's linked to a whole host of diseases when that inflammasome is activated. So by suppressing that inflammasome and by virtue of giving the brain an alternative form of energy that's uh, a better source of energy than glucose, it can then, you know, has a unique effect on a wide variety of different uh, disease processes and optimization of metabolism under normal conditions and in extreme environments. And that's what I study. Excellent. There's been a conversation about the food we eat and the mental health association with more people saying diet affects their mood it affects their focus and more importantly more importantly something that you have been studying resilience to stress from your research would you like to explain how strong is this link and where are we in terms of studying this and what are the things we've learned so far Mm -hmm. Yeah. My early work that started about 20 years ago looked at different pharmacological strategies to enhance safety, performance, and resilience in our military personnel. And in the process of doing that, more or less discovered that it, it was intimately linked to preserving and enhancing metabolic activity in the body. So mm -hmm. ketogenic diets did that. And then uh, we develop and test exogenous ketone supplements. So what that means is that we we have kind of put the primary ketone body, beta hydroxybutyrate, into a nutritional formula that can be consumed and that can quickly elevate ketones and sustain it at a therapeutic level that is associated with getting the many of the benefits in resilience. And it's true that like things like ultra processed food and poor diets can uh, are co correlate with poor metabolic health and also mental health disorders. So we know that there's systematic reviews on that. Ketogenic diets, well, for psychiatric disorders, anti-epileptic drugs are often one of the go-to drugs uh, for that. And they often don't work very effectively as for epilepsy too. So there's a movement now that spawned called metabolic psychiatry. And the idea is that you use a metabolic dietary intervention to change the person's metabolic physiology, reduce inflammation and change brain energy, but also you have very significant changes in neurotransmitter systems in the brain. And that's why uh, there, there's multiple mechanisms associated with improvement in our mood and our behavior with diet therapies. And we've studied them in animal models and in cell models. And now I'm working with groups that are doing about a dozen different registered clinical trials uh, looking at this. Dr. D'Agostino, that sounds very interesting. So there is a debate about ketones, carbs to fuel the brain. There is a balance. Ketones are the brain's super fuel. They need a lot of them. How do ketones really stack up against carbs when it comes to mental clarity and brain health. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, it's one that is being experimentally studied right now. Uh, but it has been studied for it has been studied for decades, actually. Mm -hmm. So under normal conditions, uh, our brain uses glucose quite well for fuel. It's it is a requirement. We always need glucose for fuel. So it's not using ketones or glucose. Even after fasting for a week, you know, uh, your brain is still getting about 40 to 50% of its energy from glucose through gluconeogenesis, which is a way that your body can produce uh, glucose under fasting conditions. We do know that as we age, the brain's ability to use glucose over time decreases and a hallmark characteristic Alzheimer's disease and other, uh, and depression and other psychiatric disorders is glucose hypometabolism. And this can be visualized with a with an FDG PET scan, which is a very you know, important imaging technology that will show you glucose uptake in the brain. As we age, our ability to use ketones as an energy source does not decrease. So one way, one intervention that we could use to restore, preserve, and enhance brain energy metabolism is through therapeutic ketosis. It is difficult to implement that in an older person with a diet. So uh, we have been working on several fronts to do uh, engineered diets that could easily put someone into ketosis and also as an adjuvant further augment the therapeutic efficacy of a ketogenic diet with various forms of ketone supplementation. Excellent. Excellent and exciting. Both. Yeah. You mentioned fasting and um, a lot of people, you know, the trend is out there. Intermittent fasting has come up in a number of conversations uh, with all this hype. Is fasting just another health fad? Or is it really have got some role to play? And is it scientifically backed? We've seen that there is literature out there to have fasting incorporate this. How would you incorporate fasting in your uh, ketosis world? I have been fast. I have been fascinated with fasting <laughs> for a very long time. It's fasting, as you probably know, has been used for millennia. Right. Hippocrates talked about it. Uh, it's sure. in ancient texts. It's in the Bible and for Ramadan. And so it's done uh, culturally and, and more recently in the last uh, few decades. Another term for fasting is called time restricted eating or time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. So sure. eating within a particular uh, window, uh, say eight hours or 10 hours and fasting throughout the you know duration or fasting. Uh, not eating any food on alternate days. There's different forms of, of fasting or doing a one week fast, which I've done a, a few times and it's not as hard as it you, you might think it would be. When you fast, it tends to rapidly uh, put you into a state of ketosis within about 24 to 48 hours. And that suppresses inflammation. Uh, it creates uh, a caloric deficit and an energy deficit in the body. So we start using our own fat for energy. And when we do that, that kicks on a lot of cellular processes that are linked actually with longevity. So it decreases certain inflammatory pathways. It helps increase insulin sensitivity. Uh, it helps uh, open up metabolic pathways that may have otherwise not been <laughs> opened up if you're eating a processed food diet or high carbohydrate diet. So it promotes what we call metabolic flexibility. And if one was to do some form of fasting uh, occasionally, not necessarily all the time, they could derive a lot of benefits from it. Dr. Walter Longo has done a lot of work. Dr. Sachin Panda. These are people that speak at our conference, the Metabolic Health Summit, and I've interviewed them for different podcasts. So the science of fasting and intermittent fasting is has grown a lot and it, it's been used for a wide variety of applications. Excellent. One is fasting or intermittent fast doing his fasting. Is there a trigger where you would say, hey, Amir, now is the time that I think we're now in a in a ketosis state and you're going to have a good run and it's going to be healthy for you. That's question number one. When is the trigger? How can we feel it? And part of the question would be, how can we get to that trigger when we have such busy lifestyle? And mm -hmm. um, how would you or what would you suggest one would do to recognize these trigger points? Yeah, another good question. I, I think you, you tend to derive a lot of benefits of fasting and the ketogenic diet if you are aware of uh, metabolic biomarkers that correlate with the benefits of that practice. So one of the 
the ideal biomarkers would be beta hydroxybutyrate. And there are commercially available monitors out there where you can do a finger prick and measure your glucose level. Uh, it's important to bring your glucose level down to healthy levels and, and also beta hydroxybutyrate. And, you know, I have a, a number of, you know, uh, devices uh, you know, on my desk because I do research on them. Uh, Abbott makes one, the Keto Mojo device is one that will measure glucose levels and also beta hydroxybutyrate. And if beta hydroxybutyrate, after about 24 hours, your beta hydroxybutyrate will get above 0 0.5 millimolar. And the therapeutic effects, the maximum therapeutic effects are, are typically achieved between one millimolar and three millimolar. So that would be what we call therapeutic ketosis. And it typically would take someone about 24 to 48 hours of fasting to achieve that. It would typically require someone to restrict carbohydrates down to 25 grams per day for at least four to five days if they follow the diet to elevate ketones within that therapeutic range. And when that happens, uh, the initial transition could, you know, some people may get some feel fatigued initially, but once your body adapts to using ketones as an energy source, also your blood glucose would go down. So your brain kind of goes through a glucose withdrawal, <laughs> so to speak. And sure. uh, after the transition into ketosis, after about, you know, it, it varies depending upon the person. It could take two, three, four weeks, but some people can transition seamlessly. Generally, your energy level throughout the day, your focus, your attention, your inflammation, all these things generally improve over time. And more importantly, over time, there's significant benefits or changes in cardiometabolic biomarkers. Blood biomarkers, but even blood pressure, uh, if you want to look at inflammation, HSCRP, for example, all these things change uh, in the favorable direction, typically. Excellent. Superb. That's brilliant. Thank you for that response. And that, thank you for clarifying that. A follow-up question that I've had from this is that, could you ask Dr. D'Agostino about how would diabetic patients come to that therapeutic threshold? You mentioned that one millimeter and three millimeter, would that apply? And what about athletes, especially people who are in active phases and then in passive phases of their, um, have got an athletic or a healthy lifestyle which is based on that. How would you get to that level? And does it affect them? Would you, what advice would you give to those run of people? Yeah, again, good questions. So let's start with type two diabetes, which is defined by an elevation of your fasting blood glucose above sure. 126 milligrams per deciliter, right? With a, sure. and you can use a, a common glucometer device uh, to measure that, you know, cheap mm -hmm. device you can get, you know, pretty much anywhere. If you have type two diabetes, a, another term for type two diabetes is carbohydrate intolerance. So essentially what's happening is that you're eating a, a level of carbohydrates. You're consuming too many grams of carbohydrates in your normal diet and that those carbohydrates convert to glucose and that, that elevates your glucose level. A ketogenic diet is in, in some ways a elimination diet and it restricts the amount of carbohydrates that you can consume essentially to fibrous carbohydrates, non-sugar, non-starch, although you can get some small amounts of, of fruits depending upon the person. So generally speaking, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet is more potent at reducing blood glucose in a diabetic, a type two diabetic than any other drug that we have, you know, a, a set aside insulin, because that's another story, any other like oral thing. So there are companies out there like Verta Health are implementing using low carb diets, ketogenic diets, and they have essentially reversed type two diabetes and put it into remission. But that does require a significant amount of oversight. It requires the patient wearing a continuous glucose monitor uh, sure. to monitor the glucose and then a team of people that they can interact with the, through an app to have real time monitoring and a, and a calculated ketogenic diet. So uh, it should be done under medical supervision uh, and the team would typically have a registered dietitian. So per the other question for performance enhancement, if someone is competing in a marathon and that marathon is a month away, that would not be a good time to start a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet Absolutely. if their standard diet is a carbohydrate based diet, because even the research suggests that it takes like a minimum of two to three months 
to favorably adapt from a performance perspective, your performance will typically go down for uh, two months, maybe three months. And then once your body is adapted to a low carb diet, your ketones are elevated and you're, you're burning fat more efficiently for fuel. Over the course of three, four, five, six months, in, in the context of endurance sports, many athletes see favorable changes in their ability to uh, increase their, their time or, or sure. improve their time in endurance sports. And that includes cycling, marathons, ultra marathons, and also athletes that follow a ketogenic diet have better glycemic control that we've actually working with uh, a team, including Jeff Volick, Dr. Noakes, Dr. Andrew Kutnick was my former PhD student. We've published data showing that glycemic control is much better even at nighttime in athletes using a low carb diet. And we think that will have favorable effects on their cardiometabolic health in the long term if they have better glycemic control outside of, you know, their athletes. And it allows them to be more fat adapted. So they're more favorably using fat as an energy source during the exercise. Thank you for giving that insight, uh, Dr. D'Agostino. That's pretty amazing. I must say it does uh, clarify a lot of questions that we had. Another follow-up question to that, and I have quite a few coming in, is that what about protein substitution? Would ketosis diet work or does it rely on fat to be getting its beta hydroxybutyrate, BHB part from non-protein sources? Does it affect or what's your thoughts on this? Has that yeah. been in ratio been discussed in the plan for a normal person? And then you mentioned athletes who want to enhance their performance or other people who want mental more clarity, i.e. the brain part substituting it. How would you fit in that model for those people? Yeah, another good question. So clinically, ketogenic diets are not historically high protein diets. There are moderate protein diets and the protein level is adjusted primarily to prevent protein malnutrition. So you want to keep protein uh, for a clinical ketogenic diet low enough because protein can potentially increase insulin if it gets too high and it can convert to glucose. So you want to keep uh, clinically uh, ketogenic diets have been anywhere from 12 to maybe 18% protein at the max. For athletes, it's generally recommended that protein can be more liberal because there's greater need for protein for muscle protein synthesis, especially recovering from exercise. If they're a strength athlete, they're going to want higher protein. So the protein level can be upwards of 20 uh, in some athletes that have a very high metabolism or in strength sports can be 25 to 30% at that high of protein. However, if protein level gets too high, that can reduce the levels of ketones that your body makes from fat because it's the consumption of fat and the suppression of the hormone insulin primarily by restricting carbohydrates and to some extent restricting uh, protein. It's that suppression of insulin and the high fat intake and the fat oxidation in the liver that when that's high enough, that converts the uh, through beta oxidation of fatty acid that creates acetyl-CoA and then that can create ketone bodies that spill into circulation. So that process could be quickly stopped if you consume carbohydrates or if you have a very high protein meal. So every meal needs to be adjusted primarily in the macronutrient ratio. However, there are ways around that by incorporating ketogenic fats into the diet, like medium chain triglyceride fats, which are typically derived from coconut oil. So these, these types of fats are converted more readily to ketone bodies. And you could circumvent the need for carbohydrate restriction and protein restriction by incorporating exogenous ketones. So that could be a ketone salt product, uh, keto starch is one, uh, or there's ketone esters. So these can be incorporated uh, into the diet to allow one to eat a low carb diet that's not necessarily ketogenic, but then supplement with ketones to elevate the ketones to get the performance benefits of the ketones. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. D'Agostino. Mm -hmm. It's pretty brilliant insight into what you're talking about. I want to just ask one more question on the same diets and the different di types of diets that are out there and especially one of them that we just touched on the protein part of the diet when to stop we're balancing this now ketosis diet with a protein diet 
versus people who are on so-called the cave diet, um, where mm -hmm. they are very mindful about what sort of carbs they're taking. They're mm -hmm. more into taking raw carbs as such, uh, obviously shying away from processed food or carbs that are giving increased levels in your body immediately. They want to have a sustained release of carbs or whether that's in the form of sucrose, sugar, and other forms, what your advice will be about the source of the carbs intake? And would it be reasonable to say whether you could get your uh, carbs from grains, uh, rice, and other sources? Does that matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another good question. Uh, one thing I think we all agree on is that carbohydrates from ultra-processed food tend to be pathological in regards to uh, their overconsumption. So they can be incorporated by some people, uh, but generally speaking, if they become too high in the diet, then you get metabolic dysregulation. So there is a trend, another diet, you, you mentioned the caveman diet or paleo diet. So one way to approach a dietary pattern, uh, if you want to call it that, is a whole food, single ingredient diet. So meaning that there's no ingredients, you know, in the food that you're eating. So it could be, you could have, you know, just, it can be meat, meat based, it could be beef, and then broccoli and a potato. So that would be sure. single ingredients. And then when it comes to carbohydrates, generally, if you're consuming sugar in the form of fruit, the, you're consuming sugar uh, and you're getting the fiber, you're getting the phytonutrients and things like that. Uh, and that's generally okay and acceptable in paleo caveman diet. What the paleo diet does tend to limit, uh, although it's, uh, I think sweet potatoes and maybe some tubers are kind of part of that diet, but rice and wheat and different grains, uh, generally are thought to have come, you know, post agriculture and the overconsumption of those, those dense starch tends to, can elevate insulin, can elevate glucose in ways that can contribute to uh, obesity, type two diabetes. So there's a trend within, you know, the, the world of low carb diets and maybe paleo caveman could fall into that. Choosing carbohydrates that are, are really, you know, I guess avoiding acellular carbohydrates. So a grain would be acellular, right? So like if you have a potato or like fruit, you're consuming it in its whole food source, but a grain would typically be, you know, an acellular carbohydrate and the carbohydrate, carbohydrate density of that food is higher. And when you consume it, you get a quicker elevation of glucose and an increase in insulin that's associated with that. So, and that's a very broad statement, but there's different, you know, <laughs> forms of the diet. Thanks for explaining that. One last question is going to be on another diet that has come up um, in the in the questions, and that is about plant-based diets. The question really that has come up are, are these opposite end of the spectrum diets? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that there is a role for plants um, from the carb source that we get? And can they still induce a ketosis therapeutic diet? pattern that we are looking for with the BHB excretion that we are targeting. Yeah. Another question I get quite frequently is about plant-based diets or vegan diets, especially in the world of uh, cancer therapy from mm -hmm. culture, like uh, from Asian culture, Indian culture. Um, the very first blog I ever did in my website, ketonutrition.org, the title of that was a plant-based ketogenic diet <laughs> because I, and that was 2018, I believe, because it's the question that I get asked more than any other question. So one can construct or engineer a, a ketogenic diet that's plant-based and it would be high in, uh, you know, things like macadamia nut, avocado, avocado oil, olive oil, and then you'd have to carefully mix and match to have foods that have complementary amino acid ratios. So you have more of a complete uh, protein from the food. And then the protein level, if it's within the 10, 15% uh, level, uh, as long as the amino acid ratios are okay, that, that could be sufficient. You know, some may argue it may not be ideal. Uh, a vegetarian diet, if you can incorporate even small amounts of eggs in that, that would be like, you know, a significantly improved the, the protein 
profile. However, I've worked with many dietitians that work with patients that, that implement very successfully therapeutically a plant-based ketogenic diet. So plant-based diets are definitely uh, an improved diet above the standard American diet. And I think they have some remarkable therapeutic effects for different uh, you know, anti-inflammatory effects. One needs to be cognizant of the types of plants they're consuming because some some people may have allergies to certain types of plants and uh, the, the the high amount of fiber can irritate you know certain gastrointestinal disorders so you want to make sure you have a healthy gut especially if you're going to do like a raw food vegan diet i think your your gut needs to be prepared for that and some people cannot tolerate it you might want to do a gradual transition into that but the uh, hippocrates institute uh, I visited them a few years ago and I met m many patients that were thriving on whole food, raw vegan diets. Uh, it is just a difficult diet to sustain and follow for a long period of time. And, and there's some data on um, uh, plant-based diets with dementia and uh, mental associations of uh, clarity and stuff. You've mentioned earlier yeah. a little bit about how the brain wants to have this super diet to help clarity of thoughts. Uh, and build a bit of resilience. Tell mm -hmm. us, we want to hear your view. And this is a question that's come up is what about stress and how could mm -hmm. I deploy a diet regimen to help me cope with the stress every day or just uh, my work uh, re requires a lot of stress and how can I cope that better if I'm on a, if I'm on what a ketosis diet versus all of the uh, diets that are out there? Yeah. Stress uh, another, yeah. Another good question. Uh, I think thinking about your food in advance and preparing your your foods uh, for the day, perhaps the, the night before uh, pre-planning, I think takes a lot of the guesswork out of that. Great. So eating Great. on the run and I think, you know, eating at home as much as possible and preparing that food, bringing it with you to work so you don't have to get fast food or eat on the go because a lot of times you just do not know what you're eating. <laughs> Even if you eat out at a nice restaurant, you often just do not know what has been put into that food, how it's been cooked, the type of oils that they use. And, and I do think it's important, just completed sort of a review on this, that spikes in blood glucose that can be monitored with a continuous glucose monitor. There are different devices you can pop on the back of your arm and measure elevations of glucose correlated with elevations in sympathetic nervous system outcomes. So, and, and also blood pressure independent of, you know, your baseline glucose that spikes in glucose can impact our central nervous system, our sympathetic and parasympathetic tone in ways ways that can contribute to anxiety behavior. And, and also if you're in a state of ketosis and your ketone bodies are elevated like beta hydroxybutyrate, that is associated with the conversion of uh, a neurotransmitter called glutamate into another neurotransmitter called GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric acid. So if we make more GABA by being in a state of therapeutic ketosis, GABA has a very calming effect. The benzodiazepine drugs, you know, alcohol, <laughs> Valium, mm -hmm. things like that work through a GABAergic mechanism. So we can actually promote an, a greater elevation of GABA. And it, it's not a trivial thing. It's a significant elevation that when, for example, we have, you know, animal models in the lab or in humans, if you're to take cerebrospinal fluid out on patients that are following ketogenic diets, you'll see almost a 50% increase in GABA and also the enzymes that convert glutamate to GABA. So, um, so diet, dietary pattern and these diets can have an anti-anxiety effect. So stress, you mentioned uh, the sympathetic system, you mentioned mm -hmm. the spikes, which was yep. uh, critical. I think also meant you talked about the backup, preparing, preparing your food, backup food, being ready, eating properly, eating home. I think that's a brilliant advice i think and and thank you for clarifying that a lot of people is like no i'm eating this outside is this no you want to know what's be, what's in the diet and um, what's been, been given to you and you want to be 100 percent sure on that and then you mentioned about gaba also how it's a, a calm, calming effect and someone um, who studies sleep medicine it also has an impact on a neurotransmitter being a, a big player in sleep big as well so mm -hmm. i think yep. that sort of all rounds up a brilliant answer to the question uh, that that you have put in all these aspects. I just want to ask a couple of last questions. One is about new health 
tech uh, need these days and the apps that are out there? I know you pointed out a few. Uh, tell us uh, just briefly about the technology that's coming up, tools that you're excited about, and what are the works that you're doing in your lab? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, a really exciting area of science that's emerging is wearable technologies, and that could be a continuous glucose monitor and also a continuous ketone monitor. And the hardware is being developed to do multi-array sensors, to have multi-array sensors in the monitor where you essentially have like real-time metabolomics. So you can measure, you know, glucose, ketones, lactate, which is important, uh, even things like cortisol and different amino acids, electrolytes, for example. So so that technology is emerging and I think it'll be available, you know, in, in the near future, it, it's coming, it's coming on board. And I think that's going to be, it, it empowers the, the patient, empowers the person to be able to see uh, if they're wearing even a continuous glucose monitor, even if they're not diabetic to see the impact on the type of food that they're eating on their glycemic control uh, and the amount of food that they're eating, the type of food that they're eating, and then they can make behavioral changes that will improve, you know, in the long term. So uh, I think we can universally agree that better glycemic control will correlate to improve cardiometabolic biomarkers in the long run. And many of those biomarkers are now another advancement in technology is home kits that they send you uh, a kit to your house and it will measure, it'll do a comprehensive metabolic panel and a, a CBC. And it will also look at insulin, HSCRP, triglycerides, vitamin B12, you know, all this can be done with about 12 drops of blood and that you put it into a kit and then you send it into the lab and you don't have to go to LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics, and it's empowering the patient who doesn't want to take the time out to, you know, who's maybe afraid to have a blood draw from a phlebotomist, but they're okay with maybe a finger prick and being able to just put drops of blood on a card. Uh, I'm very excited about that technology and the most importantly, the bioinformatics. Uh, when your results come back to you, it goes into an app and then that app can give you actionable advice. And like, you know, I'm a consultant for Levels Health and they also, it will correlate and synchronize with the Apple Watch, with a Fitbit, with an Aura Ring. And it will correlate, for example, your glucose with your sleep pattern. It'll look at, you know, deep sleep, REM sleep. And, uh, and I think really the, this N of one, this emergence of technology that allows us to be, you know, our own subject in our own research can help us uh, steer us into lifestyle choices that will improve our overall health. So my last question was going to be about Dr. Dag D'Agostino looking into a crystal ball and mm -hmm. then saying, oh, my prediction is going to be this for the future. Part of it, part of it you've already answered because you said, okay, Amir, I'm, we're going to see apps. And we're going to see people measuring, be able to measure levels closely, better, efficiently, uh, mm -hmm. and at home which is brilliant. Tell me if there's anything else you see in the ball that you can pr sort of share with us, something in the horizons and something that you say, ha, huh, that excites me as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I talked a lot about uh, blood-based biomarkers and diet, but I also really believe that, you know, relationships and mental health and that plays a big role. And I think maybe some emerging technologies, I had a call today with some entrepreneurs that are working on an app that will essentially really help to monitor our, our mental health, our, our mood and, you know, clinically help people with different psychiatric disorders, but they're also sort of developing it to for the average person just to understand you know uh, their mood and how mood and various things affect their mental health so I think I think we maybe do have a mental health crisis and I think that's due to certain behaviors that maybe we do whether it's social media watching too much news or <laughs> or different things or, or diet, dietary patterns so uh, I do think that technologies are emerging that'll make us aware of of certain things, behaviors that we're doing or not doing to improve mental health. And I think that's a, a much needed uh, field of research. Well, a humongous thank you uh, for joining us, um, sharing your brilliant insight. Loved the ketosis topic today, the metabolic therapies, loved your future insight and congratulations on doing brilliant work. I hope you just keep on doing that amazing work. 
And hopefully in the future, you can come back and share it again with us and say, okay, Amir, we did this, we're now here. And that would be even brilliant. I would love to, Amir. Thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. And thank you for our amazing audience. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Khan Clinics. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with your friends. It gives a thumb up. Hit that subscribe button and drop your comments. We love to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to spread the word. Tell your friends about us.